So you keep getting your tail whooped by your buddies in your fantasy basketball league. You've come close, second place, third place, but you never, ever brought home the championship. Come here. I got news for you. This is your year. The information in this episode is going to tremendously increase your chances of winning big in fantasy basketball. Welcome to the Game Pick Fantasy Basketball Podcast. I am your host, Robin Marks. You can connect with me on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Game Pick Podcast and at Robin Marks. If you love fantasy sports, please consider subscribing. Give this episode a like and hit the bell to turn on notifications so you don't miss any of these fantasy gems. We release new episodes every single week. If you need help with your fantasy basketball team, drop a comment with your question. I will respond to every single comment. Now, in this episode, we are going to take a titanic level deep dive about draft strategies for fantasy basketball. And at the Game Pick Podcast Network, we want to make sure we provide you, the community, with top-notch expert value. So we have a special guest. Dan Titus is in the building. He is the lead fantasy basketball analyst at Yahoo Fantasy. He played fantasy basketball for 20 years, y'all, like mad OG in the game. And he left the aerospace and defense industry in 2020 to pursue his passion for fantasy sports, iGaming, and entrepreneurship. With previous stops at the Action Network, Fantasy Pros, and the Sports Gambling Podcast Network, Titus is living his best life, talking hoops, football, and occasionally a little basketball. I am honored to present my man, Dan Titus, to the show. Welcome, Dan. Bro, uh, that was one of the, the best intros I've ever had there. Like, in the, in the lead up to it, like, I, I couldn't be happy to talk about winning strategies to actually help you win your fancy basketball championship. That's, that's what I do, man. That's, that's what I love. Damn, people out here are on the struggle bus. They've been in the league <laughs> for 10 years with yeah. the same guys getting clowned, wearing, like, having to do all kinds of loser right. things at the end of the league. Like, we got to save them, man. This is it. This, this is the life raft, man. Like, just pay attention. I'll give you a couple of tips to make your life a lot easier. And hopefully, at least you make the playoffs. If Once you make the playoffs, that's what it makes you a little bit. There's always going to be something random happening in the playoffs. So as long as you get to the dance – then you have a chance to bring home the gold. Well, let's dig in then. I got a couple questions for you, Dan. The first one is, what are some of the differences between category, roto, and points league, specifically when it comes to drafts? So we have people at different stages of their journey with fantasy basketball. Just talk a little bit about each one and if you have some tips if people are drafting in those formats. Yeah, so I'd say the first thing I would always recommend anyone if you're jumping into a fantasy league is understand the league settings first. So make sure you know whether you're playing into a head-to-head league, which generally is against different people each week, and then you play for the entirety of the season. And then once it comes to the end, if you're one of the top usually six teams in a 12-team league, then you'll battle it out in a playoff-style format that's similar to um, fantasy football, where it's just one, one, one win, you move on. If you lose, you're out. Um, And then you battle for the championship. I think that's the most common fantasy basketball league right now. So even though Yahoo's default is the points league, which I'll get into in a little bit, you'll see most people opting for the head to head league just because it's a week to week thing. If you lose a week, you still have a chance to make uh, a couple of moves to get back in the game. Rotisserie is a little bit different. Rotisserie, you're going to be playing against the entire league, the entire season, and it's going to have a combination of, points but it's mostly going to be category leagues and when i say categories i mean you're going to be playing against people in points rebounds assists steals blocks field goals made three pointers made turnovers and free throw percentage so nine categories and across those nine categories you have to have this correct balance and depending on how you stack up against in each category you're going to be assigned a point depending on how many teams you have in your league so say that i'm number one in points I'll get a a number 12 if I'm in a 12-team league. You have to manage that through the entire season. It's very convoluted. Probably one of the harder leagues to play in. So if you're just getting into it, I don't recommend doing Roto because you have to pay more attention to it. Um, It's like the perfect balance of calculating risk, but then also upside. So it's a little bit tricky Um, and less room for error. 
the last one would be points league. That's right now the default at Yahoo. If you play fantasy football, this is the easiest way to get into fantasy basketball. Very similar format. If you play DFS at all on FanDuel or DraftKings or even Yahoo, um, the point system that you're allotted, there are different point values for, depending on the category. So points, you either get two points, you get three points, same as real life. But then your assists are slightly weighted a little bit higher than your rebounds at 1.5 versus 1.2. And then blocks and steals actually hold the most weight at like two points. So it's an interesting way to kind of look into getting different players and turnovers don't hurt you as much in a points league. So the guys like Giannis Antetokounmpo, who may not be as great in head to head, is a baller in 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 points format. Same with Luka Doncic. So um, my preferred system or league is head to head, followed by points. And then lastly, Roto. Got it. And in terms of the draft uh when, when you're drafting in Roto specifically, are there yeah. any things to watch out for? Because I know most folks who have played a little bit probably played points and maybe graduated to categories. Right. Like Roto's kind of like the, you know, like Bigfoot. Like it's like, <laughs> am I like, can I, do I, right? So for folks yeah. who are taking that leap into Roto, are there any particular draft strategies you would point out for them? Yeah, I think it's a, since you're trying to, create the most balanced roster it's really hard to punt and i know we'll talk about punting uh here shortly but um you really want to try to get the guys that are like tyrese halliburton for example in the first round last year he was one of the breakout guys but if you look at his stats across the board he gives you 20 points 10 assists but it's not even just that he gives you three pointers he gives you steals he gives you free throw percentage he shoots damn near 50% from the field. So he's covering so many categories that when you're doing Roto, you want to definitely look for the guys that are going to give you that cat, that cross categorical appeal. Um, category specialists don't matter as much, but there's still elements where you could take the, the best parts of certain players like Buddy Heald, who you know you can win three pointers if you have Buddy Heald on your team, who also happens to shoot good from free from the free throw line and give you points. Where he's deficient in certain areas, you can overcompensate with you can go compensate with other players that might be able to balance out the roster a little bit more. So I think Roto just makes it a little bit more challenging to when you're in the back in the middle parts of drafts to kind of find the the glue guys to kind of bring it all in. Um, so yeah, that's why I would recommend if you're new to the game, start with points or head to head leagues, and then once you get a little bit more rhythm and comfortability around it, then go to the then you can face Bigfoot. <laughs> I love that. I love that. A uh, roto leagues, the the bigfoot of fantasy basketball. <laughs> All right, next question: Do you have any uh, funny war stories or anything interesting you can share from a draft? Something crazy like somebody drafting. Like I saw in a mock draft recently, somebody took Victor Webb and Yama with like their first round pick. Anything wild like that that you've seen? Bro, I think that's going to be that's going to wind up being the norm this season, man. I'm not going to be surprised when I see Wemby going off the board with in like the later part of the first round. Because everyone's like just got the Wemby watch, man. Like he's a freak. I saw him in summer league and just looking at the way that he plays and being into the the Spurs system. Like I feel like that's like the perfect the perfect combination of 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 player to to culture and and development. So yeah, that that one's gonna be probably end up on my surprisings list. Um, I think the one story I have is even last year. I have a pretty competitive league that's made up of of industry analysts and experts and and my my homies just from from way back when that I've been playing for 20 years. So it's been funny to watch the league evolve. And I had the fourth pick last year and I hadn't gone into into it with the intention of punting. But my first pick was Giannis Antetokounmpo. I was like, all right, how do I build around Giannis? So I just started going big heavy. And I, when I walked away with it, I had like Zion Williamson. I had Rudy Gobert. I had Alper and Shingoon. Like, I was actually feeling all right. I was like, man, I'm going to probably dominate at least five, probably six categories. What I didn't project was Giannis just absolutely nosediving free throws. His steals and his blocks were down from the years years past. Um, Ru Rudy Gobert was one of the biggest disappointments of the season, even though Carl Anthony Towns missed a majority of the season. His block numbers were not as of years past, definitely not def defensive player of the year, which is where I, where I paid for him at third round value. So I was so hyped talking, talking mad smack this whole entire off season. I'm the Yahoo guy now. Like I've been doing my thing. And then I wound up finishing like 11th out of 12, man. Like it was 
no matter how much I tried to crawl up out of there, man. And then I just got dogged by everybody in the league. Like, bro, I thought you was Yahoo now. Like, you're supposed to be that guy. Now, I will say, I, I do have a very good record on Yahoo. You can check my receipts. Um, I usually place at least in the in the top six. You know, I'm always a perennial playoff guy. But to be bringing up the rear like that, pause, um, at 11th, man, that was just, that was brutal. It was embarrassing. Embarrassing, Sean. So I got something to play for. So I'm listening to myself. When I'm telling y'all this, like I'm, I'm trust me, I'm gonna be deploying this strategy as well. So, yeah, yeah. I, I gotta make up for that. And I guess it didn't help that Zion was uh, wilding out in the club with the Instagram models. No, no, it didn't. And then I also drafted Ben Simmons. Like I didn't draft him early, but I had the thought. I was like, oh, I'm building a big unit. You know, what I'm saying like, pause again. Uh, yeah, field goal percentage, you know, the assists and the blocks, like, and the steals. Like Ben Simmons does do good fantasy things, but. You know, he checked out after like, you know, I mean, like he barely even played last year. So, yeah, it was just a bad, bad selection across the board. So we'll talk about it in a little bit. But, yeah, I have I have some war stories with the punting or at least trying to execute it effectively. Yeah, it was like um, the keeping up with the Kardashians on your roster. It was like, <laughs> so, so, yeah, Ben Simmons, Tristan no, Thompson. You it had- Bro, it was the worst. It was the worst. I definitely yeah, I probably Chris, should have had Humphreys. Kyle Kuzma was probably up on there, man. Like <laughs> I only missed good. out on book. If I had book, it might have worked book. out. Me, but mm. everybody else was a dub, man. Yeah. That, was, that was bad. All right. So uh, next question. Um, do we have to punt to win in nine category leagues? I'm just or in cat leagues in general. Do you have to punt? I don't think so. Um, and, you know, I tried it last year and, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say I won't ever do it again, but I, I think it all depends on how your draft is unfolding. Right. So I don't think anyone should go into a draft expecting to punt something unless you, unless you know how your league mates are going to draft. I think it's kind of hard to predict what they're going to do when the, when the players are on the board. Cause everyone makes those surprises. Like if Wemby jumps up in the first round, if I'm sitting behind that guy, I'm gonna be like, whoa, this is a, another guy that I wouldn't have anticipated to be on the board right now that maybe I could have that would have been off my board uh, if Wemby didn't get picked there. So um, I do get it from a, a pure number standpoint. You're playing in nine category leagues. Sometimes you're playing with eight. It always helps if you can reduce that number to six. If you can dominate six categories very well, you don't have to worry about the three other ones. It's just the combination of punting, whether you're you know, you have to go with correlation. So. Most guys that are getting, if you're punting rebounds, you're probably going to be punting blocks too. Like those big men do, if they're around the rim, that's what they do. Um, same with three pointers. Like usually that's going to be coming from the guard spots. If you're fading three pointers, then there's probably going to be some element of fading assists as well. And that's kind of what I did with my big, my big man lineup. I wound up having Darren Fox last year be my anchor, which, you know, he had a great season. That's probably the best pick I made on my team. Probably the only good pick I made on my team. Um, but he also doesn't do, he doesn't give you high end assists or high end points. He's kind of somewhere in that middle there. So yeah, I think punting just makes it harder to build uh, the perfect roster. I, I get it from a strategic standpoint, worry about less, but I'd almost rather target the all-stars and the people that I know that are very good basketball players and working around that. Like I'm okay with, waiting on blocks or rebounds to make sure I'm getting the high end players in the first three rounds. And then I'll pivot the rest of my team strategy around that original build on those first three picks. So rather than punt, I would say build off of your first three picks and see where the rest of the roster goes after that. That's good. So my next question, you kind of answered it. So I want to unpack this a little bit more. So talk to me about the pivot. Like, are there any signs, any indicators, maybe even player types and positions that you see going off of the board at a rapid pace that maybe you need to start developing a punt uh, strategy in the middle of the draft? Yeah, so I think in the first round, I think you'll see a lot of point guards and guards in general go. Um, Points and assists are the hardest things to get on waivers as you get later into the season. So that's a, a point of emphasis that I would make is, if you're if you're drafting, I would try to target the points and assist guys first and then build up them as those big men and other guys later as you go into your draft, because you can find rebounds on waivers. Um, you can find blocks, you know, uh, Drew Eubanks averaged over a block and some change last year, and he got serious minutes after Yusuf Nurkic was out. He came free. Um, 
Mark Williams is a guy that emerged late late in the season last year. Who's probably going to get more minutes? He's definitely going to be drafted in on in leagues this year, but he's not going to be a high draft pick. He's not going to be going with the likes of Brooke Lopez, DeAndre Ayton, um, you know, in those middle rounds. So you can get these guys late. Jalen Duran, another late guy that's going to be really solid for rebounds, uh, field goal percentage, and blocks. So I would just say emphasize points and assists early, three pointers early. You can get those on waivers too, but I, I would try to get the guards that can do the most. And those are the Halliburtons, the Anthony Edwards, who's going to have a monster season. Um, uh, honestly, even this might be a hot take, but I feel like Chris Paul is a guy that's going to fall way late in drafts that you'll be able to get that. Even if he's coming off the bench in 20 minutes, he can still give you almost seven assists and probably 13 points with a steal and really good peripherals. So like, those are the guys that I'm looking to get rather than maybe a couple guys that like a clay Thompson who just hits threes and scores points, but clay hurts you in a lot of other areas. He doesn't shoot well from the free, from the field goal uh, percentage. He doesn't really do much defensively anymore. He's kind of a shell of his old self. So yeah, I would just focus on the points and assists early and then fall back on the blocks rebounds as you go later on in drafts. I don't think that's a hot take at all. I think that the, the, the real ones know what Chris yep. Paul is going to, what he can do in 20 minutes, 25 minutes even. Mm -hmm. And I think that he is dropping like a ton of bricks. People are like, oh no, it's over for him. But I think, mm -hmm. especially if you're thinking about, um, you know, developing a strategy around getting some assists later in those rounds, uh, mm -hmm. middle rounds even, I think that he's a, a great value. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit, Dan. Let's talk about projections. You know, people... It's a hot topic, especially when it comes to the different platforms. So, like, you, maybe you could shed some light for us, uh, for, for Yahoo, specifically sure. around, like, what the projections are based on. Is it based on points, categories, roto? Is it a, a blend of all of the three? And then also, when people are going into drafts, do you recommend that they, like, bring their own uh, rankings and, like, a come with a piece of paper? How would you uh, suggest that folks approach that? Um, so I'll take the second part of your question first. Um, I think it's, I think it's, a, it's very important to have at least a sense of how you want to draft. Like if you don't have the time to do the work, that's why we exist. That's why people like me exist. Like we'll do all that hard work for you. I'll do the project. I don't, I don't actually do my, my own projections this year, but I at least do rankings and I update these rankings very frequently because y'all don't have time to be worried about the latest Woj bomb or which team got traded in this thing. And this guy's moving up the depth chart. He's got a competition battle, positional battle. I'll do all that homework for you. And I'll, I'll account for all that within the ranking. So I do, I do think rankings are important as you're entering the draft. I'm not saying that they're gospel or that they're law, but it just gives you a baseline of, Hey, where could I get this guy? Or where is this guy generally going? And to touch on your projections piece, I don't think that projections are, are mandatory but i think that they're another tool that you can use to your advantage to understand the balance between historical performance and future output so people much smarter than me and this is part of yahoo too we have partners in the industry that we work with to uh you know crunch these numbers about how these players are going to evolve in their situation and their you know their depending on where they are in their career um there's a lot of variables that go into it. And from a, a development standpoint, it's primarily just how are these people going to perform in the minutes that they're going to get? So you start with the minutes. If you can project the minutes that these guys are going to get per game, then you can kind of scale that out based off of usage in the past. Um, the, the system of the, of the coach, you know, are they high fast paced offense or do they kind of slow it down? Um, and so all these calculations I think are just great they're great anecdotes to understand in unison with the rankings, why people may be ranked in certain places. You may not think that Walker Kessler is a household name because he's not, he's some guy in Utah that's tall and blocks shots and gets rebounds. But if you look at his, what he's projected to do in more minutes with Kelly Olenek, probably sliding into a different role off the bench, Walker Kessler didn't emerge into that center, that center position until midway last year. Now that he could get 30 minutes a night, those rebounds are going to go up. Those blocks are going to go up. Um, that's what the projections are accounting for. 
and sure, they're not not all projections are created equal. Some are going to be wrong. We're going to undervalue some people's contributions in some areas and and overvalue um, in other places. But in general, the projections at least just give you a baseline expectation of what you can. If you draft this guy, what are you going to get? And especially if you're trying to punt, having some knowledge of what these guys do well and what they don't do well in advance of that is a huge advantage to your league mates who may not have an idea. They could just be drafting off of what they watch on TV. And sometimes you don't get all of the story behind a player and what they could do or where they could grow to um, with just the eye test. So getting all this, this analytical and statistical advanced data infused in with that eye test kind of gives you a better position of where should I draft this guy? How should I draft this guy? When should I draft this guy? Um, so I always walk into drafts with a ranking, whether I was doing it or not um, for, prior to my life in Yahoo always had rankings very nice so uh, i want to piggyback off of that a little bit so people go into draft rooms with their buds people are locked in on those projections like the the list that's there in front of them talk to me about the queue and how important the queue is especially like sometimes people get buried like 500s, 300s, like you won't even see them. How important is it for people to get in the draft room a little earlier and maybe get some people in their queue so they don't miss out? So that that's funny that you said that because one of the first things that I do whenever I'm entering a draft room, and this is probably just because I've been doing this for way too long, I actually start at the bottom. I, res- I resort it, start at the bottom, because then I start looking up to see which people are like, why are they, we- why are they still there? Um And so that way you won't forget about them when you're getting to the later parts of the draft. And it's like, uh, you know, most of these, the main guys that I know are kind of off the board. Now, let me go start going for my home run swings or these guys are going to break out or my sleepers that no one really knows about. Um, Jalen Williams is a guy like that, that did that last, last year. Right. So Emmanuel quickly. And um, yeah, so I usually start the bottom resort, but I, I think it's a great point that you brought up with the queue, because I think some people maybe undervalue the, the importance of a queue. I can't tell you how many times in 20 years I've either had, you know, 20 years spans a while. So I didn't always have this legit super fast internet, right? Like I was in bad reception areas. I was, the thing just cut out. I don't know. Some freak rainstorm is happening as I'm drafting and I wind up getting an auto pick. The worst thing you can do is auto pick in fantasy. So I recommend having no less than five to 10 players in your queue at all times. Because there's always going to be those moments when you think someone's going to come back to you and you're waiting, waiting, waiting just for the guy right before you to just take your guy. And then you're left there scrambling on the clock like, uh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You don't have to worry about that. At least if you have your queue of five to ten, you have options. And that's the key. Always have options and a pivot plan in case that the guy that you were expecting to come to you doesn't get there. So you telling me you've been doing drafts so long, you was doing drafts on dial-up? <laughs> you was on AOL? You was... <laughs> Yo, Dan Titus <laughs> doing drafts since dial-up. <laughs> Bro, I was drafting since uh, I graduated high school in 04. I was definitely drafted in 01. And 100%, I was still, that was still like AOL dial-up wow. a little bit, for sure. That is so good. Oh, <laughs> my goodness. Uh, I'm going to take a quick commercial break. This episode is brought to you by the Fantasy Sports Shop on Etsy. Grab your exclusive fantasy sports swag today and if you have ideas for the next drop just let us know in the comment section of this episode also this month we will be giving away a shirt to one of our community members to enter all you have to do is subscribe to our youtube channel and comment the words free shirt to take a look at what we have in stock visit bit.ly slash the fantasy sports shop now really quick i want to um keep it going we talked about projections a little bit. Um, let's talk about uh, category league specifically uh, and finding well-rounded players versus specialists. Tell me how you weight them. You know, I, I know we talked a little bit about Tyrese Halliburton earlier on, who's yeah. one of the most well-rounded guys in fantasy. Right. Talk to me about well-rounded versus specialists and kind of your position there. Yeah, well-rounded is, is you know, in baseball terms, it's the five-tool player who can provide the most value for you across categories. Um, you know, typically we've seen some big men kind of rise up, you know, obviously Nikola Jokic is the best basketball player in the, on the planet right now. And he's the best fantasy basketball player. 
That's not going to change. Uh, Joel Embiid still remains a top three pick because he can do so much efficiently. And I think that that's what you're chasing when you're talking about um, – when you're talking about well-rounded players, it's the combination of production and efficiency. Um, A player that's ascending up draft boards now, you know, last year he was probably a fourth round pick. That's Macau Bridges. His efficiency for what he's doing and the volume that he's going to get and that he already got as a member of the Brooklyn Nets, he sustained that value. So um, getting players that can give you defense, you know, they're, they're both side player. They're, they, they play on both sides of the floor. So they'll give you defense and they also give you the offense. But then they also are just, you know, intelligent basketball players, high IQ players, Jalen Brunson type players. Um, Those are the players that I love to target in fantasy. And you're certainly going to have to have your mix of category specialists. And I think that that's the beauty of of doing head to head leagues is that, you know, you can focus on the well-rounded guys probably early because as you start to get a little bit more down the in the trenches of the draft, the well-roundedness kind of goes away. So then you can start targeting people like if you're light on rebounds, go get Steven Adams because he's going to give you at least 10 rebounds a game and he shoots a good field goal percentage and he'll give you a block here and there. Um, But he plays a lot of minutes when he actually plays. Um, I talked about Buddy Heald earlier, three point specialist. Same with um, uh, who's going to give the nod for three pointers. Um, Someone like. Uh, who was it? Not Kevin Porter Jr. Um, Clay Thompson. I mean, Clay Thompson's good for three, three threes a game, but you're not expecting much else. So I think that they hold a place in fantasy if you're deficient in other areas that the well rounded guys don't cover for you. And you're not going to be able to get it. I mentioned Jalen Dern before. You need rebounds, go get J- Jalen Dern. You need rebounds, go get Mark Williams, go get Clint Capella. Clint Capella is a guy that continues to get disrespected year after year. And I know that he's always on the trade block. But if you decide to go with guard and forward heavy early in the drafts, and then you're sitting in round, round six, round seven, looking for a big man, Clint Capella will give you 10 rebounds. He'll give you a block and almost a block and a half. His free throws stink, but you know, he at least shoots a good field goal percentage and he's playing with Trey young so he can catch lobs. So uh, there's value in waiting uh, to get these guys that can just win you specific categories or just add to those counting stats. Um, steals and blocks are definitely the toughest counting stats to obtain, but you can have the block. You can get the blocks on waivers probably more than the steals. Um, so yeah, I would say start off with the well-roundedness as much as you can. And then once you get to the later rounds, then, then target the specialist if you're deficient in certain categories. Very nice. So talk to me about some folks that, or some players specifically, if you can just off the top of your head, that folks need to pay attention to in those later rounds, even mid to later rounds, like maybe past round six and beyond folks that maybe are getting slept on. We talked about Chris Paul a little bit, mm-hmm. and you could rehash some of the guys. Definitely. Um, everyone out there, get your pen and paper and write these names down. Uh, first one, I would say Jalen Green. People are going to be off on him because he was not an efficient player last year. But guess what? He improved in every statistical, mostly every statistical category outside of field goal percentage. But I think that's going to come up. He's got a new coach in Ime Udoka that's a proven winner, took the Boston Celtics to the championship. Um, and they brought in Fred Van Vliet, who's a guy that I think is going to only raise the floor for the Houston Rockets. They have a lot of talent on that team, and I think he's going to make that next step and shoot at least 46% from the field. Well, call it 45% from the field. Um, but I think you'll also see that, that increase in points, rebounds, and assists to the point where I think he's going to be you know, a top 70 player this year. Um, should have been last year, but I just don't think that that whole situation with Steven Silas was clicking. Now that they have a real coach in the building that can listen and, and rally the troops, like I think this is going to be the best version we're going to see of Jalen Green. The next player I would say that you're going to probably be able to get in round seven or later would probably be Trey Murphy. And I think people are going to be put off by Trey Murphy because Zion Williamson's coming back, Brandon Ingram's healthy, playing with Team USA. But one thing that we saw out of Trey Murphy last year was he was like Mikel Bridges light. This dude can knock down the three. He plays defense. He shoots at a high clip. He can get you steals. He is like the poor man's uh, Mikel Bridges, even though he's three inches taller. But I had a chance to talk to him at summer league. And I was like, yo, Trey, like, what do you think you could work on in this season? Uh, you were 47th in fantasy basketball last year. He had no idea what I was talking about. I was like, I don't, I don't even know what, what 40 or what? I guess that's good. Uh, but if I had to tell you something, it's going to be getting to the line more. I want to draw more fouls. And I'm like, great. You're already a phenomenal free throw shooter. 
I could use that volume on the free throw line. So I think we're expected. I'm going to expect to see a more aggressive Trey Murphy, um, despite having to potentially compete for minutes with um, other people. I think he's going to start over Herb Jones now. Um, I think this guy's going to be also posturing for a really good fantasy season. Um, kind of later, later, later. Um, let's see. Uh, Jonathan Kaminga is another guy I got my eye on, man. I, I think that the Warriors made certain maneuvers to get rid of um, players that they felt like were not going to help them win another championship. They decide to hold on to Jonathan Kaminga. I think he's going to be slotted to play a lot more minutes and seen a lot of maturity and growth in him in just the off season. I try not to put too much weight into these off season workouts. I mean, Ben Simmons is like the summer <laughs> you know saying, yoked up. He's like the summer, like superstar, man. But um, I like what I've seen out of Jonathan Kaminga thus far. His jumper looks a little bit smoother. Um, he's been working on his ball handling and it's really just the IQ for him. He's got to buy in. And I think Steve Kerr said that a lot towards the uh, the playoffs last year or in the, at the end of the playoffs at the conclusion of the season because he was salty, he wasn't getting any minutes. So I think that maturity was huge. And now that he's got a couple people out of the way now, um, I think this is going to be a good season for Kaminga, especially with Draymond Green getting a little bit older. And now they're going to have to rely on some of those um, those youth, those youth uh, younger players a little bit more. Um, Derek White, I think, is another guy that you can probably get as a mid-round pick that I think is going to – and shout-out to Noah Rubin. I think he was the first guy of NBC Sports to really be on the Derek White hype train, at least this season. Uh, but now that Marcus Smart's out of the way, um, this guy's a perfect fantasy player. You're talking about well-roundedness. He's among the best in the league at block shots at the guard position. Um, he gets you the assists. He get he can shoot off the dribble. Um, he's great at spot up, so he'll give you three pointers. He plays very well off and complements Jason Tatum very well. They have very good chemistry, so I'm expecting him to to move up to around you know anywhere between five and a half to six assists this year. Still have the points. He'll get you some sneaky boards as well. Just a, an exceptional player that plays on both ends of the floor. So I think he's a guard that people are going to probably overlook just because he doesn't look, I don't know, the part. At least he shaved his head. He's not he's not rocking that that Sherman Helmsley anymore. <laughs> Thank God. We're moving on up <laughs> <laughs> to the uh, east side. <laughs> Oh, that's good. Yeah, but but he's a but he's a hooper though. So I I appreciate it, and uh, I think he's going to be another solid mid round pick. That um, you'd be surprised at the value you're going to get for what for where he's going in drafts. Very dope. That's good. You gave them a lot. That was a bunch. Yeah, yeah. That, I w- definitely went into you, that one. You went um, in on that one, and no. I'm sure I'll have plenty more. Make sure you read my articles as they're dropping on on Yahoo. Um, I'll try to give out all my knowledge, at least enough that. Y'all will be able to get to the playoffs and potentially take home your title, but I can't give away everything because I know this. I know there's people lurking in my, in my, uh, my comments trying to see what strategy I'm going to do so they can put me in 11th place again this year, but it ain't happening. How does that, (laughs) how do you manage that? Because I struggle with that. Like I play with people who listen to my content (laughs) and it's like, they're in my head. Yeah. how do you They'd do be it? Sniping. Like last year, they were sniping me like crazy. Like, yo, Titus, this one's for you. I'm like, this guy, man. Like you reached a, a whole round, a round and a half to get this guy just so I wouldn't. And it happens in football. It happens in everything now. And I feel like it's good because to me, it's just healthy competition. And honestly, I like that. At least if, if it works out for them and they get a guy that I was on, then cool. All the better. At least I was right about something. I just didn't get him. But um, that's the thing about fantasy is like, you're going to, as much as I want to say projections and rankings are important, like they help you, they're helpful, they're a helpful tool. But if you have an inkling about a guy and like a feeling, like just draft your guy. Like there's going to be certain points where you're going to be like doubting yourself whether, man, I should have, I went with the, the Yahoo recommendation and now I don't like it. I should have went with the guy that I wanted to because he went right after I picked this guy. Don't have regrets, man. Just it's, it's a game, have fun with it. But if you watch the game and you have any questions, like, Target the guys that you're comfortable with. You know, if you have questions, that's why we're here. Like, hit me up, hit up Robin. Like, we'll answer the questions if you got any debates going on in your head on who to draft. But get your guy. Get your guy. That's gonna be the next shirt. <laughs> get your guy. I like that. I like um, that. <laughs> Dan, this is a, a fun question. What is your favorite position to draft from in a 12 person league? Um, so this year, I think my, my viewpoints changed a bit. I've done four NBA mocks because Yahoo just opened last week. 
Um, I know fan tracks is starting to get theirs going on too. Um, I used to really like 12. I love the turn because I can kind of shape the market. You know, on my first pick, I'm, I'm getting the value in the second pick. I'm like, all right, now I'm going to, cause I know this, I got to wait a whole you know, like 23 picks before it comes back to me. So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go get my guy right now. And I'm gonna set the stage. So I used to love 12, but I think this year I'm actually targeting six. I think that's the perfect place to be in a 12 team league because there's an opportunity for value to fall, but then also you can take healthy reaches, but I think you're going to have a lot of good players around those mid round picks. And I think where I messed up last year was um, I reached a little bit too far on a couple of players like drafting Zion. Like, I mean, he was a fantasy beast, but like now I know, like I just can't rely on him to be healthy for more than 65 games. And that's one thing I also didn't mention before is, the, the healthy balance of you're going to see Kawhi Leonard on your rankings at like 20, anywhere between 20, anywhere between 15 and probably 30. Rightfully so. Dude's a great basketball player, but you have to bake in the fact that, that man is probably not going to play 65 games in a season. So you got to think about the long term uh, value of these players, too. So, um, and also the contract situations. James Harden, he's already sliding down my rankings because I don't know what's going to happen with that situation with the Sixers. And Damian Lillard, I, I mean, he says he's going to play, but what if he gets traded to the Miami Heat? Then Jimmy Butler's value goes down. Dame's value probably goes down. So just just keep attuned to those situations. But again, that's why we're here. We'll do that for you. And that's where we'll, we'll adjust our rankings according to that. Um, but yeah, I think the six is the best spot, man. Like that that's where you're going to be able to execute getting a top end player in the top six picks. I, I think it gets a little it gets a little subjective when you get to seven. It's like the Curry's, the Durant's, LaMelo Ball, um, Kyrie Irvin's in the discussion. Anthony Davis should be if he wasn't so health, um, uh, such a health risk. But I feel like you dodge that by getting a, a six pick. And on the turn, same thing. Um, you have your choice of the pick of the litter. You can reach for a guy like Anthony Edwards. You could go for Macau Bridges. You could go for a, a Trey Young if you feel like he's going to have a good season. Like I just feel like there's just so many more um it's more it's more balanced when you can get the six pick versus the 12 because i think i'm reaching a little bit less um than being in the 12 spot i don't really like one you get Nikola Jokic, but then after that i'm like damn i guess he's the perfect person to ever build a team around because he does everything but i'm also like every Jokic team i've had over the last couple of years um i need to hustle a little bit in the waiver wires to like maintain my status there so um yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, six is the best spot for me. Love it. I love uh, one in 12. I just never get one in real life. Like, <laughs> I've literally, I think I've been playing fantasy for maybe, this might be my seventh year. Yeah. I've, in a real draft, I've never, never gotten a first pick. So I got a, I got a lot more years to put in. I got, <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't start in dial up, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> So I got it's like, gonna happen. It's gonna happen at some point. And I just hope when it does happen, Nikola Jokic is still playing basketball because yes, I'm taking uh, him. Yeah. <laughs> with no hesitation. Don't don't mess that up. Don't get cute. Take Nikola Jokic. So I got a couple of questions from the audience before we get out of here. The first one is from my man David Vega, who is a game pick aficionado. He says, How high should Anthony Davis go in a category league? What's up, David? I think that's a that's a great question that I think every year changes. Anthony Davis at one point last year before he got hurt was the number two fantasy player in per game value. So you know what he can do. It's just the same question that I have with Kawhi Leonard. I think you have to drop him down at least to the beginning of the second round. I'm not taking him in the first round because of that injury risk. I'd rather have someone that I know that can play, you know, somewhere in the in in the 65 to 70 game range. Um but I, I wouldn't be mad at you if you wanted to do like a big, you know, depending on where you are in the draft. If you're, say, like you're 11 and 12, if you go like Jaron Jackson Jr. and Anthony Davis, you're locking up defense. And, uh, yeah, that would just be a dope combo, um, I think. there, Or pairing Anthony Davis with like a guard like Damian Lillard or something like De Devin Booker or something like that, Kyrie Irving. Um, but actually having Kyrie and Anthony Davis would probably give me a little bit. That would make me a little squeamish if they're going to miss some games a little bit. But yeah, I think uh, second round, early second round is certainly fair for Anthony Davis. All right. Next up, we got my man, Christopher Lee. He says, 
How do you prioritize value and punting in a dynasty startup? That's a heck of a question, man. And to be honest with you, my dynasty basketball shares are not that high. I played in a few leagues over the past couple of years, and I love drafting rookies and, and watching them ascend and build. But um, I don't know how the heck I would figure out punting in that strategy because, um, yeah, I guess it just depends on who you're looking to draft. Like if you have Wemby – I don't know how you're really punting because I think he's going to be one of those fantasy unicorns where he's going to be able to eventually do everything. Um, but you're getting somebody like, um, you know, Bilal Koulibaly, who is raw talent. I don't even know what he's going to be as a fantasy player yet because he's so young and he has so much room to grow in terms of his role in the Washington Wizards. Though I think that's a good landing spot. I just don't know what I can expect that I necessarily want to eliminate certain categories. Um, so I would just say draft whoever you draft um, in dynasty startups, I would say focus the punting on the players that are um, after you make your first three selections, worry about the punting after you have your core foundation of players and then don't worry about punting for your rookies because they're going to take some time outside of the main guys like Brandon Miller and Scoot Henderson. They're going to play immediately. The rest of those guys are kind of projects. Very nice, man. Dan, you killed it, man. Uh, you have any uh, parting statements and words for the people who are drafting this season, any uh, in words of inspiration for them trying to claim <laughs> that first chip or their second or third chip? Yeah, I would say, on top of like having a rankings like kind of next to you to just as something to glance at in the, in the midst of drafting and having your queue set up, I would also take the time. If you have it, like you can draft on your phone, like do some mock drafting, see test out different draft positions because you may like certain spots. And if you have the option, you at least get the familiarity with what, what type of build you may have in doing certain mocks and what position you're going to be drafting in. So, um, if you have the time, you like some drafts you could have is like set for 30 seconds. So it goes very quickly. You're not occupying a whole bunch of your time waiting for people and bots to make their picks. Um, but I think mocking is probably the best thing that you can do to prepare yourself ahead of a draft. Just so you know when people are going, when to target sleepers, um, who, where to avoid landmines and just where the tendencies are with certain people. And even though that's different from draft to draft, you still can get a, a general consensus of, okay, I got to feel like this guy's going to the third round. I might need to reach a little bit for this guy if I want to get him um, in certain places. So um, other thing I would say, uh, don't be a stranger to soaking up information. There's a lot of different outlets out here that provide fantasy analysis. Uh, not everyone's right, but I think uh, having a diversity of opinions is, is always good. If, you, if there's a creator that you like, that you vibe with, that you like the way that they view the game and how they analyze it, rock with them um show support show love and um yeah man i would say don't limit yourself though like there's a lot of options out here a lot of cool people i'm sure robin's gonna have a lot of them on the show at some point um but yeah i would say just just try to reach out as much as you can like most of the fantasy basketball community in terms of the the analysts and the experts are very open we always want to help you win um so if you have questions man reach out to us we'll, we'll definitely help and if you have that direct line uh, I must say that's a that's a pretty nice little advantage over your league mates who who may not be on on X or Twitter or whatever it's called or Threads or whatever, um, trying to get their basketball knowledge. Very dope. All right, my brother. Well, listen, we are grateful, honored that you are here to to bless this audience. I, I'm praying and hoping that people will get value from this video for years to come. Thank you so much, Dan. That. Sit tight no for doubt. me. I'll be right back. All right. For sure. Wow. If you are looking for a community that will help you win your league championship, you got to join our private Discord server of over 1,200 fantasy basketball fanatics. All you have to do is visit bit.ly slash game pick podcast to sign up for free. Again, if you need help or advice, drop your questions in the comment section below. I promise I will answer every single comment for this episode. And don't forget... Play the waivers, set your lineups, and check out the next episode, you freaking fantasy nerd. Peace.